Okay. Newton's first law of motion told us what is the default case for motion. So if there's no net force acting on an object, it just continues going forever and ever at a constant velocity. So the speed of the object can't change and the direction that it's moving can't change. So that's that's our default, that's our starting case. Now, what happens <clears throat> if the sum of the forces is not zero? Well, if the sum of the forces is not zero, we're in the domain of Newton's second law. So what Newton's second law is telling us in words is we form the net force on an object, and that's going to equal the mass of the object times its acceleration. Um, and the acceleration is uh, the time rate of change of velocity. So Newton's second law of motion is coupling together uh, acceleration, the change in the state of motion of an object, with the net force acting on the object and the inertia of the object. And it's, I think this is fairly intuitive for everyday life. Um, if I want to change the state of motion of something that's massive, I'm going to need a large force to do it, right? So if the inertia is large, I need to have a large net force to see some acceleration in the object. Okay, so maybe that was uh, too math wordy for you. Uh, imagine just playing catch. Would you rather play a game of catch with a baseball or a bowling ball? Everyone is going to say baseball because the baseball has less inertia. You are going to have to exert less force to catch uh, and throw baseball as opposed to a bowling ball. Playing catch with a bowling ball is going to be very dangerous to your house, to you, to everything around you very quickly. All right. So um, as a mathematical statement, um, we have Newton's second law of motion, add up all the forces acting on an object. So that is our net force, just the vector sum of all the forces together. And that is equal to the mass of the object times its acceleration. And acceleration is the time rate of change of velocity. So it's dv dt. Uh, and then we have to keep in mind that this is a vector statement. So for each of the three spatial dimensions, uh, that we experience, there is Newton's third law, or I mean, Newton's second law applying along that spatial dimension. Uh, so whatever you take to be your x direction, you have Newton's second law for that, for the y and the z, for the three uh, perpendicular coordinate directions, whichever way you choose to orient them. Okay. And then I also want to add that this is effectively, for this class, what we mean by mass, right? Um, inertia, or the mass of an object, is its resistance to a change in its state of motion, okay? So the more inertia an object has, the greater the mass is here. That means to get some acceleration, I need to have a larger net force acting on it. Um, this is not the way like a kilogram is defined anymore. That's in terms of like a standard number of particles in a particular uh, sphere. Uh, but be that as it may, you could just as well uh, have this be our definition for what we think of as mass. Mass is this constant of proportionality relating the net force on an object to the acceleration that the object experiences. Okay, let's go through some questions, make sure we are understanding what Newton's second law is saying clearly. So an astronaut is floating weightlessly in orbit and shakes a large iron anvil rapidly back and forth. She reports back to Earth that which of those is true? The shaking costs her no effort because the anvil has no inertial mass in space. Shaking costs her some effort, but considerably less than on Earth. Or three, although weightless, the inertial mass of the anvil is the same as on Earth. See, which of those makes sense in terms of Newton's second law of motion? Talk it over with your physics friends, and then when you're ready uh, to go over the answer, 
unpause the video. Okay. So although weightless, the inertial mass of the anvil is the same as on Earth. Mass is mass is mass. Um, you can think of mass as just being the inertia of each individual atom that makes something up, and you add all of those together, and you get the total inertia of the object. That does not change. Now, um, a little bit about the term weightless. Uh, here, uh, weightless, I sort of wish there were a different term for it. Um, but let's imagine the following scenario. You're in an elevator and say you're gonna hold your pencil and the elevator has a catastrophic failure. So it just goes into free fall, okay? So the elevator is falling at the rate that gravity would make it fall. You are falling at the same rate and then your pencil is also falling with that same acceleration. So it's falling the same way as you in the elevator. In that scenario, if I were to just let go of the pencil, it would float in front of me as if there were no force of gravity. It's not because there's no force of gravity, it's because the pencil and you and the elevator are all falling the same way together. That's what we mean by weightless. Doesn't mean that there's not a force of gravity. It means that you're all falling the same way so that relative to you, the pencil just floats there. Okay, right, so that's dealing with just the term weightless and what that means. The larger point for this question is that inertial mass is inertial mass is inertial mass. Um, the weight of an object is proportional to that force of gravity, um, but the force of gravity or weight of an object is a force, and then uh, mass is a different related quantity. All right. Other question we have, I have a car that rounds a curve while maintaining a constant speed. Is there a net force on the car as it rounds the curve? No, its speed is constant. Yes, or it depends. It depends on the sharpness of the curve and the speed of the car. So go back to Newton's second law of motion. Think about what you think the answer is. Talk it over with your companions. And then when you're ready, uh, to proceed and go over the answer, unpause the video. Okay, so a car rounds a curve while maintaining a constant speed. Is there a net force on the car as it rounds a curve? Yes, there absolutely is. If an object is going to change the direction that it's moving, like a car turning, um, that can only be accomplished if there is a net force to cause that acceleration. I think. Uh, being people that uh, drive in the state of Indiana, where we have winter and ice, we're pretty familiar with this concept. Uh, if you try to turn and there's not enough force of friction between the road and the car, you're not going to be able to turn and you follow Newton's first law of motion and just keep moving in a straight line. You wanted to turn left and then it's just not going to happen. Not enough force of friction, you just keep going straight. Okay. So you, anytime you want to change the direction that you're moving, a uh, car, you walking, whatever that happens to be. If the velocity changes, that means there's an acceleration. Acceleration through Newton's second law of motion means there's a net force. Um, and we want to emphasize this uh, just so it's clear in everybody's mind. The net force is a vector. It points a particular direction in space. Uh, and then the acceleration vector also has to point in that same direction in space. So Newton's second law of motion, the net force and acceleration are parallel to each other. 